Hey everyone, good afternoon or morning to you, uh, wherever you are. Thanks so much for joining me here. Uh, my name is Barton Siever. I am a chef, author, and seafood evangelist, uh, as well as the, uh, the lead instructor and creator for seafoodliteracy.com, our online seafood training program, helping, to, helping the world to become more confident and competent uh, in all things seafood. Uh, I'm joining you today from my home kitchen here on the coast of Maine, uh, directly in the heart of small scale local fisheries on a really pretty crappy rainy day. Some of my neighbors uh, to the north are getting about a foot of snow today, which I just I just reject. I'm ready for spring uh, and the fisheries and delicious things that come with it. Uh, but today uh, we've got a, a big topic to talk about, which is how, how do we support local slash regional slash small scale fisheries? especially in this time of economic and cultural crisis. Uh, and we're going to wind around a little bit, uh, talk about a number of the contexts of the global seafood industry, but then also just uh, end up really, well, where it all matters at the end, which is on the plate. Um, so uh, a couple of notes uh, at the beginning. When I say the word fisherman, uh, what I'm referring to, uh, and I believe so uh, that I'm doing so respectfully, as I've learned from members of this community, that fishermen uh, includes the entire diversity of people who are engaged in the economy and pursuit of putting food on our plates from the oceans, lakes, and rivers. Uh, and so when I say the word fisherman, please know that I, I use that uh, in an inclusive way. Uh, also, that uh, when I talk about fishing, I, I'm also talking about farming of seafood as well. Uh, aquaculture is a whole different topic that's worthy of, of several days of content, but um, please know that when I think about seafood, I think about, well, everybody involved in its provenance and production and all of the different means by which it comes to us. So thanks again for joining me. Uh, a, a little bit about myself and my path how I came to be in front of you today. Uh, so I was born and raised in Washington, D.C., uh, and spent a lot of my summers down on the uh, tributary of the Chesapeake called the Patuxent River, and there I spent my entire days in the quest for food, uh, running down the docks, pulling giant blue crabs off the pilings, fishing for stripers and, and bluefish, spots, rays, croakers, porgies, I mean, you name it. There was bounty in those waters, and that became my, my baseline. Um, ever since... In utero, literally, uh, my mom and dad were taking me down to uh, the very famous Main Avenue Seafood Wharf in Washington, D.C., the nation's longest continually, continuously operating seafood market. Uh, so seafood was just a, a big part of my life. It was a big part of our diet. It was, well, it was kind of how I understood the world. I was, uh, sure, I was fascinated by the stars and the sky and astronauts and all sorts of things that young kids are, but I was also an avid reader of Yule Gibbons, the great forager. And uh, as much as I was interested in what was up there, I was also really interested in what delicious might be underfoot or under wave at any time. And that's really driven my career and that passion for seafood and all the flavors, textures, aromas, colors, narrative seasons that it brings to us uh, has driven my career. And I've lived, uh, been very fortunate to live and work all over the world. Uh, in great fishing communities in Spain. Uh, I lived in Morocco for a while where I worked as a fisherman, done a lot of work in the Gambia and Senegal uh, in fisheries and worked as an explorer for the National Geographic Society and got to, well, I got to travel all over the world and it was pretty cool. If there was water and fish there, I had business there. And, uh, it truly is a delicious and interconnected world. Uh, but I was in Spain uh, working in a little restaurant when a chef named Jose Andres um, a man who, a chef who now just goes by Jose, like Prince or Madonna. He's, he's earned that status uh, for his work. Uh, if you're not familiar with him, check him out at worldcentralkitchen.org. Uh, he, he truly is a hero, elevating our entire industry and, and the power of food. But uh, Jose called me back from Spain to come and run one of his uh, flagship restaurants in Washington, D.C., 
And it was really Jose that taught me that a chef is more than the sum of the ingredients that we put on a plate, uh, that we are interconnected to community and the decisions that we make have far reaching ramifications. Uh, but not just in a guilty way, hey, chef, behave, make the right decision, but also in, hey, chef, man, wow, what, a, what an incredible platform you have uh, in order to, to create positive change. Uh, you know, and, and at that time, this is the early 2000s, late 1990s, you know, we were really beginning to get interested in, well, uh, the role of chefs as, as providing nutrition, sustaining the people who came through our front door providing them healthful meals and entertaining safe spaces. Uh, and I really took that to heart. But I also began to really understand that it's not enough to just sustain the folks at the front door. You, you have to sustain the folks at the back door too, the people who make the food you serve possible. And so with that, I got very interested in uh, sustainability and um, following in the model of, of the advent of or the, the reemergence of farmer's markets and, and the great, uh, in trends that Alice Waters and other chefs uh, started. But with sustainability in the early days, it was really kind of about just demanding sustainable production from the fishermen, that it was sort of seen as it was their responsibility to make it sustainable. And it was our responsibility as consumers and chefs just to, to ask for it. But that's, it's a lot more complex than that. We, we have a big role to play in this as well. And I think part of the, the problem about putting the, all the onus on the fishing communities was that it became very easy to vilify them. Uh, if overfishing is the problem, if depleted oceans are the headline, well, then what's the solution? Duh, it's underfishing. It's removing the human presence from the oceans, right? Well, no, actually, it's, it's, it's far more complicated than that. And we as consumers have a really big role to play in that. And that's really the thrust of what we're going to be talking about today. Um, our coastlines uh, in America, and I'll just keep it uh, to this country, but these ideas expand to, to many national borders. Um, these coastlines are a connection that we have back to our very origin story. I mean, it was, it was upon the backs of cod that this nation was founded and the men and women that fished them. Uh, it was our first economy by which we took our steps towards economic and political freedom. But we turned away from the tempestuous waves of the North Atlantic and began to, well, explore a different ocean, one that rippled with amber waves of grain as we turned westward and went inward. Uh, and I think to a large extent, we, we begin to forget and lose connection to those rural coastal communities, to the fishing communities. Uh, and what happens there is that, that we, we've just lost that connection. And, and now seafood just seems to come from somewhere else, as though it, it's just from away. And well, to a large extent in America, to a huge extent, it is. 90% of all the seafood we eat in this country is imported. Now, that in and of itself, imports are not a bad thing, uh, but what we need to do is find a balance and ways to support everybody that is producing sustainably produced seafood um, and get more of it on our plates. So the bottom line is in America, we, we, we understand like the small American farm, you know, the amber waves of grain, the rolling plains. We get that. We understand the, the undulating hills bathed in autumn splendor setting sun with the, the red barn with the paint fading and the white house paint chipping the picket fence. And we're like, hot damn, we get this. We understand it. We see ourselves in that American iconography. But if I ask you to close your eyes and, and picture a fishery, so often people lack that connectivity. And they might stand on a dock and gaze wistfully out at the wine dark sea thinking as though a fishery happens elsewhere. But to understand a fishery, you stand on that dock. Yeah. But you turn around and you look at the mortgages and the quality of education and the opportunity for a daughter to follow in six generations of bootsteps to take helm of the lobster boat. That's 300 feet away from me right now. That is a fishery. It is the sum of the labors and aspirations of a community. And when we begin to understand a fishery as such, we begin to see ourselves, our own desires, our own values reflected in the work of the men and women that bring food to our table. And in this time of crisis right now, uh, we've become really keenly aware of our neighbors. 
Uh, we've turned our attention again to the micro climates in which we live. And we're beginning to understand how much we rely on each other. And how much we rely on fishermen is, is amazing because without them, we would have no access to the ocean. I mean, it's fine and great to sit on a beach and gaze out and you know see a sailboat on the water, but that's like going to the circus and just sitting outside the tent the whole time. It's not until you go in, dive deep, that you understand the carnival of life that is there. But fish are not just for our use. They fish deserve to exist for their own sake. They're part of an ecosystem. And so it's a responsibility we have to fish sustainably, to support those sustainable uh, producers and economies. Um, and what's great is that we've proven that we can fish and farm sustainably. We've proven we can do it. And so now we know that we should, and we know that we can invest our dollars in creating systems that we want to see. And with that, I'd love to turn it over to a great friend of mine, Ben Martens, also a neighbor. He's the head of the Maine Coast Fishermen's Association, and I'll let him tell you a little bit more about himself in a short video he's supplied for us. So, Patrick, if you would, take it away. Hi, everyone. I'm Ben Martens. I'm the executive director of the Maine Coast Fishermen's Association, and we're an industry-based nonprofit. We work with local fishermen throughout the state of Maine who are uh, coming together to fight for sustainable fisheries and the future generation of Maine's fishermen. And so I really appreciate Barton's invitation to talk a little bit about our organization and really the fishermen that are at the heart of it. Um, you know, they go out every day trying to chase down seafood, scallops and lobsters and ground fish, uh, all kinds of things that are tasty on the dinner plate. And uh, they do it because they're trying to feed America, but also because they're trying to feed their families and keep a cultural and uh, cherished tradition going uh, in a lot of our communities. Maine is a state with a lot of coastline and as you head further east along our coast uh, the communities rely more and more on the fishing industry to survive. So it's it's not just about our history, uh, it's not just about making money, it's not just about feeding people but it's really about our future too. The working waterfront in Maine is so vital to the blue economy and future opportunities. The Gulf of Maine is filled with fish. Uh, we know how to protect it. We know how to do great work out there, rebuilding our ecosystem. And um, we have fishermen that really believe in that. So serving seafood that comes from Maine, it's being caught by local fishermen throughout the country, is just a great way to support uh, local communities, remote communities, healthy uh, choices for consumers, and um, we appreciate everything you guys can do to try and serve Maine seafood in restaurants and at home and encourage others to do so as well. Awesome. Ben, uh, ben is amazing. And uh, his, his organization is, is great. If you didn't catch that there, it's Maine Coast Fishermen's, uh, dot fisherman dot org, uh, I believe. So in following up on, on what Ben was saying uh, and what I was saying earlier, it's, <laughs> we really need to uh, engender a, a massive cultural shift in just the way that we look at our relationship with the oceans and food systems in general. Uh, the bottom line is if, if we think about that, that small family farm on land, uh, we think of the land beautiful for our presence there, that we cultivate, we make better, we improve the land by our presence. And yet we think the ocean beautiful simply because of our absence. And we need to change that. We need to begin to understand that fishermen and farmers are stewards of our environment. They are the connectivity. They are the key to healthy ecosystems in terms of constituency that cares, that interacts with, and has a vested interest in sustaining what sustains all of us. And the bottom line is that in this planet, we need seafood. You know, we have a growing population. We're running out of arable land. Uh, we're asking the very tough question of how are we going to feed 9 billion, 10 billion people on this planet? And a, well, a really good part of the solution is to look to 71% of the planet that is ocean. I mean, it's, it's pretty obvious, really. But we also need seafood for, for many reasons. When it comes down to personal health, there is very little that we can do in, in terms of diet, a plant forward diet that we eat, you know, portions of, of seafood regularly is one of the, the surest ways that we have in order to ensure our own health. When it comes to the choices we make for that center of the plate protein, 
let's not think about seafood in a vacuum. Is this seafood sustainable or not? Let's think about it in terms of what are the other center of the plate ingredients that we use? Beef, pork, chicken, lamb, veal, turkey. You know, what fills the American diet? Well, bottom line is an overabundance of those in our diet has made us sick. And quite honestly, an overabundance of that in our diets has also led to some really disastrous environmental circumstances. And when we look at how do we feed 9 billion people, well, we need to look at efficiencies. And seafood, things that float in the water, are just simply more biologically efficient than you and I and a pig and a chicken who are busy keeping our blood warm and fighting gravity, growing big bones and muscle to fight atmospheric pressure. You know, there's a lot of land that's needed to grow feed for those, there's a lot of fresh water use. Um, there's a lot of impacts that are a lot lesser when it comes to seafood, just categorically, than with any land animal protein. Now, I'm not anti responsibly raised land animals at all. They're, in fact, they're vital and necessary. But I do think that we need to look at seafood in context and ultimately just increase the amount of seafood that we are eating. And well, if we need more seafood, the bottom line is that means we need fishermen. We need farmers. And that's what today is all about because, well, today finds a lot of our fishing communities really in, in deep trouble. And it's not just about saving the fishermen or saving seafood. It's, it, it's also about learning how and, and really enjoying it, really participating in it. Um, with the COVID-19 outbreaks and, and the crisis that's upon us, the seafood markets in some places have slumped as much as 95%. Now think about it, whatever you do for a living, if 95% of your work just vanished literally within the span of a week, uh, it's insane what fishermen are dealing with right now, from, from big to small, global to regional, whatever it is. And a big part of that is because 70% plus of seafood in America is eaten outside of the home, meaning in, in food service, in cafeterias, in restaurants, uh, in high-end restaurants. And you compare that 95% uh, slump with what's happening with Turkey, which is 126, uh, 126% percent growth pork over 100% growth in the last couple of weeks, beef 90% growth, chicken 70%, wow. And seafood went the exact opposite way. Well, it, it makes it tough. It makes it tough, especially on small scale uh, fishers and farmers, because a lot of them, well, their business model needs high-end restaurants. It needs people, consumers who are paying uh, not a premium price, but a true price for a product that was produced well that delivers on quality and narrative and story and virtue and value and connectivity. But with restaurants closed, uh, those business models uh, are tough because you simply can't compete with cheap commodity uh, produced fish. Now, again, there's nothing wrong inherently with lower priced commodity fish, import or domestically produced, frozen, buy it at Walmart. I, you know what? There's some really great quality, really responsibly sourced seafood there. The bottom line is we just need to be focused on seafood. But as we're talking about these small scale local regional fishers, um, it's a particular challenge and one that we have an opportunity really now to step in and help float the fleet uh, as they navigate these tough times. You know, retailers even who are experiencing a huge surge well, they're whittling down the number of seafood offerings that they carry to just the, the popular few, you know, salmon, tuna, shrimp, tilapia, you know, the, the normal ones. Uh, and this all makes sense with their inventories and reducing the number of deliveries that are coming in the back door and the amount of customer interaction. I get it. But where does that leave the diversity? Where does that leave us as consumers? And I think now is the time for us to really look forward and see a new food system, one that asks us to look around and uh, take into account and give empathy to our neighbors and to ask what's delicious underfoot. And so with that, I'd love to now introduce another friend, another neighbor, uh, Tog Braun from Down East Day Boat uh, Scallops, uh, who was just at the house here yesterday dropping off some amazing treats, so thank you for that. But uh, Tog also shared a little video about her business, and I'd like to introduce her now.
If you're lucky enough to live along the coast, then you should be buying your seafood directly from fishermen. If you can't do that, then you should be working with a fishmonger that connects you as closely as possible with fishermen because you're gonna get a much better product and the fisherman is gonna get a much better price. You should be aware though that you might think that it would be less expensive to do this, but sometimes it's gonna be more expensive. And that's because the traditional seafood distribution system is really efficient at delivering quantity. There are many steps between the fisherman and the consumer, but things move fairly quickly. Um, each link in the chain wants to move as many pounds as possible. It's all about quantity. Um, and it's good at getting you really cheap products sometimes. You can get uh, frozen tilapia for $5 a pound at Walmart, and if that's what you want, that's great. It's an inexpensive protein, it's healthy, you know, that's fine. But if you want to really taste pure, fresh, delicious seafood, you need to work with someone that's got a different type of model. I have one at Down East Day Boat. I don't have a warehouse. My uh, scallops stay on the ocean floor until you order them. But that can be difficult then to work with lots of very small boats fishing at the uh, in the worst months of the year at the far corner of the country trying to coordinate all of their small harvests to get them in FedEx boxes within 24 hours of that harvest. That's tough. That can be difficult. It can be very stressful. You're juggling a lot of boxes or that would be bad. Juggling a lot of balls. Um, and so you're gonna pay a little bit more for that product, but you're going to taste the difference. I have customers that repeatedly tell me, oh my God, Togue, I had no idea that scallops could taste like this. And it's, it's fun to hear that, it's, it makes me happy, but it also makes me sad to know that most Americans have never tasted pure fresh seafood because the traditional distribution system can't provide it. So be aware, you should buy directly from the fisherman if you can, and if you can't, you need a fishmonger that really is gonna connect you to the fishery. The fishmonger you work with should be able to tell you the name of the fisherman that harvested the product, the bay it was caught in or the area it was fished from, and uh, when it was harvested. If they can tell you all of that information, then you are probably gonna get a really good tasting product because that guy's probably more focused on quality than he is on quantity. So go out, buy more fish from fishermen, from reputable fishmongers, and uh, you'll be good. <laughs> Uh, Tog is Tog is amazing. She is an all-star uh, who I've long admired uh, long before I met her. Uh, I, I admired her from far, and, and now I'm lucky to count her as a neighbor. So myself, Ben, Tog, we've made the case for why fisheries matter, why, why small farms matter, uh, why seafood matters. So, uh, well, let's let's turn to cooking, because ultimately that's what seafood is. It's dinner, right? Um, and one of the first things that we need to do as consumers, uh, and, and a big opportunity that we have, I think the biggest one that we have, especially as it comes to engaging with small scale uh, artisan uh, fishing, is that it's not enough for us to demand sustainable seafood, uh, just to buy seafood. We have to also behave sustainably because we are a significant part of the seafood supply chain. We're the end goal, right? And if we're making ridiculous demands, well then guess what? Fishermen, they've got to meet our demands. And well, here, let me give you some examples. So diversity. Diversity is just simply the cornerstone of sustainability, whether it's social, whether it's biological, whether it's economic, you can't have, things don't survive when they're monolithic. And the bottom line is the oceans are full of an incredible diversity of seafood. But most people would never know that. You know, up here in New England, you know, right down there, of course, you know, this is the history, the, the lauded history, historical grounds of the cod. But also the pollock and the haddock and the hake and the cusk and the ling and the monk and the skate and the wolf and the dog and the eel and the ray and the pout and the place and the flounder and the dab and the black pack and the witch pack and the blah, 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 blah. I mean, there are 27 different flaky white flesh species swimming within a reasonable day's drive of us right here. But we're, as consumers, only willing to pay an appropriate price for cod because we're familiar with it. And guess what, folks? It's the same damn thing as Pollock and haddock and hake and cusk and ling and monk and skate and wolf and dog and eel and ray and pout and place. And, you know, if you bake it in spiced tomato sauce and serve it over a brown rice almond pilaf flecked with a little bit of cilantro on top, like, wait, what, what, what was the fish again? It doesn't matter if you buy the right quality fish. 
and you know, sell the sell what's comfortable and what's familiar. I mean, people know exactly what that dish is going to taste like, even if they've never even heard of the fish that's in it. You know, other examples, if you look at the Southeast uh, and the Gulf Coast, you look at the snapper grouper complex, as the fishery there is called, uh, because snapper and grouper are the primary targets. But there's over 70 other species that are managed and part of that same fishery from hogfish to grunts to all sorts of 17 different kinds of snapper and porgies, I mean, you name it. And all of those fish, they eat relatively in a similar way. Of course, there's lots of differences, but there's also enough similarities that that's what we should focus on in terms of our comfort and our ability to support fishermen. On the Pacific coast, you've got uh, Pacific rockfish. And there's over 70 different species of that. Uh, one category of fish. I, I mean, it's just an amazing diversity that we forego. I mean, do you remember when grocery stores a few, not so many years ago, tomatoes were pink, hard, cylindrical, yeah, pretty nasty. Uh, lettuce meant iceberg. Apples, you had green and red. That's it. That's all you got. Now you go into the, even the most modest grocery store and they got 10 different kinds of apples and kale and arugula and spicy mustard mixes and, uh, you know, uh, heirloom tomatoes that are just kind of weird. Does anybody want to give any of that up? Do any of you want to go back in time and say, like, no, actually, I just want a cylindrical, hard, unripe Roma tomato? No, but we're stuck in that same sort of artless agenda when it comes to the oceans. Oh, no, no, no. I, I don't want the catch of the day. I, I, I want cod. And by doing that, what we, what we do is we create a, an economy based on demand rather than on supply, which is inherently unsustainable, not only ecologically, but economically for the fishermen. They need to be able to sell at a proper price whatever the ocean is able to sustainably afford. So the first rule getting into cookery, the first rule of good seafood cookery is buying good seafood. That's it. There, there's nothing I can do. Not even the incredible, amazing, talented, legendary Rick Moonen can take a bad quality piece of fish and turn it in to anything greater than it was. The bottom line is you got to start with good ingredients. So why would you subjugate the quality of your ingredient to a static recipe? You walk in the store, you're like, well, no, I'm sorry, my recipe says snapper. That's what I need. And it's like, yeah, well, Bart, you're in Maine in April. Ain't no snapper here, dude. Ain't no snapper here. No. What do you got? Oh, you got a Cadian redfish? Cool. Great. There's always an option if we are willing to buy it. So don't subjugate to the recipe. Bottom line is just buy, buy the catch of the day. It's not a new concept, folks, but it would revolutionize fisheries and it would revolutionize the economy that small scale is able to engage in. Okay, so now that we're into the culinary phase, uh, I'm gonna share some ways that I uh, use to, to think about seafood, to categorize it, um, how I approach it. But I also wanna start uh, you know, getting some comments from you about you know, what are your greatest memories about seafood? What What's that amazing thing you had that was on the coast of somewhere that you'd never heard of and it came out and it was just like amazing. A lot of people have that story and uh, that's what we need to harken back to. So one of the great tools that, that I like to, to use and teach people is, is the idea of culinary categories of seafood. And if you look uh, on, on the banner there, there's a downloadable PDF that we uh, put together uh, that just lists a whole lot of different species, about a hundred, in terms of how they all fit together. So flaky white flesh fish, that long wrap of different species that I gave earlier. Uh, filet fish, that I call them. You know, snapper type fish. There's dozens and dozens of fish that cook like that. The salmon category, there's multiple species of wild, farmed, arctic char, steelhead. Uh, steak fish, things like tuna, swordfish, shark, marlin. If you understand and dedicate yourself to, to learning how to cook the category, all of a sudden you're competent and confident in cooking anything in that category, which makes you now the fisherman's greatest asset because you're willing and capable of buying whatever they catch. So please uh, download the, the culinary categories, uh, use that as a reference. 
Uh, but please also understand, no, it's not perfect. It, it doesn't always you know, completely accurate. Uh, it's like saying Pinot Noirs are all the same. No, they're not. No. I mean, a, a bluefish that's a baby bluefish that's this big and in late summer is going to be a whole lot better and it's going to cook different than a giant bluefish that's been around for years in the springtime where it's a little bit lean and lots of connective tissue in there. Yeah. I mean, there's details that we got to pay attention to. But bottom line is this is a framework that we can use to apply a, a limited set of techniques that we're comfortable with to always achieve great outcomes. So a great technique that I like, um, for example, slow roasting. It works with the majority, any fish that doesn't have a lot of connective tissue or really uh, dense texture, any of the cod family, um, even you know, snappers and smaller fish in the filet family, uh, the salmon family. There's a whole lot. You put it in the toaster oven at 275 degrees, sit back, call your buddy Rick Moon and say, hey, Rick, you want to have a you know, Zoom session here, a little happy hour? Let's have a glass of wine. Well, let's, as we do with Rick, we, we have another glass of wine. Oh, oh, wait, oh, no, it's cool, man. It's sitting there at 275. It's just resting. It's cool. You know, the amount of time it takes to go from raw to cooked at 275 is a long time, which means the amount of time it takes to go from cooked to overcooked is a long time too. So sit back, relax, enjoy the process and have a delightful result at the end of it. So um, these are ideas that we, we understand. You know, we, we have techniques that we, we fall back on. Maybe it's a salad dressing that you throw in whatever salad, you know, sustainable seasonal ingredients you have. Um, yeah, this is, you're about to get a cameo from my cat here. Excuse me. This is mini biscuit. That's my little baby. Excuse me. Anyway, um, we've got this. So I'm going to switch over screens here and see what questions we have. Start taking some of those and reading off some of the comments you've got. And then uh, I want to talk about resources that we've got. Uh, there's a banner underneath the screen there. Uh, that says localcatch.org. If you're looking for... Uh, a way to connect to small scale, local, regional artisan fisheries. Uh, you're going to find an incredible resource there of men and women all over the country uh, that are creating really just a new economy. But um, before we get into more resources, um, let's go to some questions. Hey, look at that. There's my buddy, Rick Moonen. Uh, how amazing and diverse will our oceans ecosystems look like after the smoke rise from COVID? Um, you know, Chef, you're absolutely right. Uh, we hear a lot of bad news about the oceans that, uh, you know, fish are depleted, overfished, and the oceans are empty. But bottom line is if you give them a break from fishing, uh, you know, admittedly, the human presence is, is very impactful. And if you give them a break, fish rebound very quickly. Uh, nature is incredibly productive and wants to fill the, the, the void. Um, and we, we have countless examples of this over history. If you look at uh, World War II, the period there, you know, when there were U-boats patrolling the waters, like, I, I'm going fishing. No. And everybody's focused on the war effort. Well, you start looking at the the stock, uh, the, the, the amount of fish that were in the water after that period, it rose dramatically. Uh, another sad example is the uh, Deepwater Horizon spill in the Gulf. You know, after that, when, when fishermen were, were devastated, put out of work in a terrible way, uh, one silver lining of that was that the fish rebounded. And there, there was huge... Uh, bounty of it there afterwards uh, to, to celebrate and, and take part in. So, Chef, uh, I, I think we're going to see a, a good bit of that resurgence of natural bounty, but unfortunately, we're also going to see an incredible amount of attrition in small businesses. Uh, we're going to see, even though there might be more seafood out there, I think there's going to be less ways for us to access it. Um, less of those mom and pop, small husband, wife, husband, husband, businesses, whatever they are that, uh, that bring it to our table. And well, that's what we're here talking about today. So, Hey chef, thanks. I really appreciate you showing up today. It's a nice honor. All right. No, another question from uh, Jay. Hey chef, I was the first graduate of the Ruby seafood literacy program. Awesome. Thanks Jay. Um, we inquired about the coastal culinary Academy up in Maine and uh, designated for groups. So uh, thanks for your question, Jay. The coastal culinary Academy is, um, and augments the online course. And that is, uh, we offer immersive uh, deep dive 
fishery training programs, two and a half days up here on the coast of Maine, where I can show you just about every aspect of the modern seafood industry with, with a couple of exceptions. Uh, dive deep into the history as well as look forward into the future, uh, all while learning, you know, meeting Togue and Ben and Steve Train and, and all sorts of other just incredible charismatic characters on the coast of Maine. Uh, and really learning and creating your own narrative about what seafood means to you. Um, and at the moment, we're just doing that for for groups, mostly aimed at uh, enterprise, so hotel groups, uh, large-scale food service, just by virtue of it, it's easier to aggregate those, uh, those audiences. But um, I hope someday to host you, Jay, and anyone else who'd like to come up and just hang out in my backyard, eat lobsters with fishermen and, and Talk seafood, right? Cool. Uh, Hilda is coming up next. Brilliant. How you literally listed off the 100 fish available in length speed. Thanks. I, I have practiced it, I, I will say. Uh, please talk again about the Bear Mundi. Can I get it on the west coast of BC? Sure. Um, Bear Mundi is a, a recent introduction to the American palate. It has long been a uh, favored fish uh, in the uh, in the Pacific, especially in Australia, uh, where it lives in brackish ecosystems as well as in saltwater brackish, meaning uh, the confluence of freshwater rivers and uh, saltwater. Um, it's a fish that's long been part of the diets because it's been accessible. Uh, and it's a fish that takes on so many different characteristics depending on, on where it's, uh, it's caught, uh, but now increasingly uh, where it's farmed. And there's a couple of really, really successful, really great luminary examples uh, that are farming Bear Mundi that are really leading the entire industry forward, no matter what they're farming, uh, really are the example. Um, you've got Kulbara over in uh, Thailand. You've got um, Australis Bear Mundi, which is really the uh, Josh Goldman, who is really the, the person up in Turner's Falls, Massachusetts, way inland, who, who really brought it to, uh, to the fore and... Uh, it's a delightful fish. It's got uh, the texture of a cross between a snapper and salmon, that soft, silky, flaky, yielding uh, bite to it, but also just a hint of snap from the snapper. Uh, the skin crisps up beautifully, a huge amount of fat in it, uh, well-flavored, pairs with just about anything. Uh, and because people are doing such a great job farming it, it's really become available uh, all the time. Uh, and, and honestly, it's it makes a really great frozen product. Uh, so it's really available everywhere. Um, see all, all year round, but also the, the wild capture stuff is, is a delicacy and worth seeking out too. So Hilda, thanks so much for your question. Michael, how do frozen seafoods retain nutritional value during thawing? Um, I can't speak to a detailed science on that, but I uh, do know that uh, looking at the nutritional analysis of frozen, now thawed seafood, uh, that it is still a very healthy option for us and something that is, is recommended that we include in our diets at least twice a week. Uh, I can't speak to how much nutrients are lost in that process, uh, but I can say that the result, the resulting fillet or, or fish, whatever it is, does still retain enough nutrients to make it highly recommended. So I'll, I'll, uh, that's a curious question though. I'm going to look into that, Michael. Thanks for that. All right. Elizabeth C. I live on the Chesapeake Bay. Hey, neighbor and friend. Uh, we have a lot of white perch. The safe fish to eat or there are pollutants and mercury in this fish? Uh, that's a very good question, Elizabeth. Thank you for that. Uh, that is a concern. Uh, there are persistent organic pollutants um, resulting from years of uh, inappropriate industrial practices that have ended up in our waterways that aggregate in the fish that many of us like to eat, unfortunately. Uh, this is particularly true and uh, requires caution when we're talking about freshwater species, uh, just due to the physiology of how fish, how their physiology works in freshwater, uh, as opposed to how the physiology works in saltwater uh, because of the way they uh, regulate salinity in their blood by osmosis. That's getting a little nerdy though. Um, but uh, white perch are a, a, um, a migratory species, a nadromous species, I believe. So they're related to the, uh, 
the striped bass or the rockfish. And so they, they do swim from saltwater into fresher water, into fresh water itself. Um, and so it really depends on the season. It depends on the size of the fish and it depends on the region. Uh, but fortunately, local uh, game and wildlife uh, uh, services uh, have per paid particular attention to the pollutants in really recreational fishing. And uh, there's some really great resources available no matter what state you're in. Uh, I would look for that either through state extension service or through the, the marine or the, the wildlife warden or the game warden. Thanks, Elizabeth. All right, Sue. What's the best way for an individual consumer to connect with fishermen and obtain their products? Well, Sue, what a great leading question that is. Let's talk about resources. Um, so localcatch.org down at the bottom there, uh, that is a, a really great aggregating site uh, put together and run by another friend and neighbor of mine, uh, Josh Stoll, the University of Maine, who's really had a brilliant stroke in, in terms of understanding the need for uh, that sort of clearinghouse. Um, he doesn't sell fish, but he, that website will connect you to the people that do. And, and they don't have to be in your neighborhood. Uh, you know, fish gets all over the place. And, and a lot of the folks that are listening to local catch are bringing fish down from Alaska, um, you know, from the seasonal fisheries up there. And um, don't be afraid of frozen fish. There's really great quality product out there. So, um, you know, it's all around us. Another couple of resources that I'd look to, um, FultonFishMarket.com uh, operates, they're a, a web-based service that operates out of the legendary Fulton Fish Market in, in New York over at Hunts Point uh, and making available to anyone the same quality that Michelin three-star chefs go seeking out. Uh, I know that Chef Rick Moonen, not to talk about you too much, Rick, but well, I love you and I miss you, friend. But um, I know that when he was uh, operating in New York, he would go down there, you know, two in the morning or something to pick out his fish. And those same fish that he picked through, uh, they're picking through and, and being able to get it out to folks. There's there's a lot of other groups that are doing similar things from uh, sea to table. Uh, some really great friends that have been doing that for many years. Uh, there's a program, uh, Dock to Dish. That has been uh, that started off in Montauk in, in New York area, but but has now been replicated in uh, the D.C. Chesapeake area as well as L.A. There's some incredible chefs, Michael Chimarusti, who's a hero of mine, uh, Kyle Bailey over in uh, in D.C. as well. So Doc to Dish, I'm not exactly sure what they're doing uh, at this moment in response to the the crisis, but um, definitely check them out, uh, and then. Since uh, we announced this webinar, I've been getting uh, a huge number of emails from folks that are, are working diligently to answer this crisis. Uh, a, a great friend, uh, Julie Key, um, who is the oyster guru uh, herself. Um, in a half, she has a great website called In a Half Shell blog. She is one of the, I would say, leading two oyster experts uh, in this hemisphere, uh, the other being Rowan Jacobson. Uh, but, Julie is, is truly a talent. Uh, and she was telling me that she put together uh, a site called oyster.guru forward slash shop. Uh, and we can put this in an email and, and send it around to everybody registered. Uh, but she's working to aggregate a list of all of the small scale oyster farmers that are sending out their product direct to consumers. So that's a great one. Um, and as more and more uh, of these efforts come across my radar. Uh, I think I'll put them in an email and, and make them available as a resource. But um, yeah, there's a lot of people trying to figure this out. And uh, yeah, another great one is uh, my good friends, fishchoice.com. Uh, and that's more aimed at uh, professional chefs and, and restaurant to, um, you know, wholesaler, but everybody's reinventing everything right now. So that would be another great source to, to just find people who are in the conversation fishchoice.com. Awesome. So thanks, Sue. Appreciate it. Um, oh, and Tog. I'm so sorry, Tog. Tog just uh, chimed in there with uh, downeastdayboat.com. Uh, she delivered some absolutely astounding scallops to me yesterday and some amazing crab meat. Um, 
and uh, lucky lucky to have her in the world. So she is another. And then uh, I'm actually going to do an unboxing because some other great friends of mine here in the neighborhood, uh, Jen Levine at uh, Gulf of Maine Sashimi, gave me a mystery box of seafood that I'm going to open up here in a minute. But uh, Sue, back to just one last point on, on your question. It's virtuous and wonderful and great and recommended that you connect directly to the fishermen. Please do. But please don't shun seafood that comes from the commodity markets or the big players. Uh, there are incredible companies out there who are really dedicated to quality, to provenance, to social uh, welfare, uh, to environmental sustainability that, that are selling their products uh, at Walmart. Like Seabest uh, is, is a great one run by Beaver Street Fisheries out of Florida. Highliner Foods, what they do and, and the fish they source from all over the globe. They're, very well, maybe a lot of people on this webinar that would disagree with me on this, but uh, I believe that we just need to eat more seafood. Uh, we need just to incorporate more of it into our diet, and we need to support all the systems that are able to bring it to our tables from sustainable producers in ways that uh, help the communities that it's from. So big is not bad, but small sure is tasty. So, all right, next question. Uh, Let's see, Manish, I believe. I hope that's the way to pronounce it. What's the best way to make best way to make fish in gravy? Well, it depends on your definition of gravy. Whether you're uh, Southside Philly Italian uh, by heritage, and gravy means red sauce, or whether you're uh, up here in Maine, and gravy means um, thick brown viscous liquid with cheese curds in it. No, wow, there's a lot of different ways. Uh, but basically, what you want to do is because fish cooks. Uh, so quickly that pay attention to and put the time in to develop the flavor in the gravy. Let it simmer. Put the hard herbs in there like thyme or rosemary, bay leaf. Uh, let it simmer down slowly. Take the time if you're thickening it with a roux to really cook out that flour and toasted butter. Give it that nutty richness to it. Uh, use good quality milk that just really tastes like something if you're going to make a, a bechamel type gravy. So get your sauce good first and then put your fish in it. And you know what? Let it cook real slowly. And then I would even recommend that then let it cool down, put it in the fridge and eat it tomorrow when you reheat it very gently. Uh, there's something magic about the way that ingredients incorporate overnight. Uh, I, I liken it to, you know, people will give you advice on marriage never go to bed angry. Um, well, just, I mean, let's put it honestly, makeup sex, you know, keeps relationships going, right? Well, to me, like letting a stew rest overnight in the fridge before reading, it's, it's just like that. It, it's just going to make everything better. So, wow, I just said all of that. Okay. So, all right. So I'm going to do an unboxing here as I answer another question. So I'm going to adjust my camera. Um, I'm also going to do a little bit of self-promotion here because, well, I, I put together a lot of resources uh, for chefs and home cooks, anybody, um, to get more engaged in seafood. And I write books. I've written eight books. I uh, just published one called The Joy of Seafood. Uh, but uh, I also published one on sea greens, which is what I call seaweed, uh, except seaweed is what my brother threw me into at the beach and held me under the, the water. And, you know, it's, it's kind of like uh, bad memories, but sea greens. Oh, that's how we eat them. It's how we incorporate them into our, our, our dishes. So let's just call them that. A um, couple of straight up cookbooks for cod and country is my first one. Two if by sea. Yeah, this way is uh, another one. And then uh, one that I think is, is particularly germane and relevant to this conversation here today is uh, American seafood. And this is a, a deep dive anthropological and social and culinary history of every single species landed in the United States. Um, going all the way back to the founding of this nation, all the way up through the present day, uh, it was richly illustrated with a photo essay, just trying to make that connection. We go to a farmer's market and we understand the virtue and value of the, the woman who's worked so hard to produce this beautiful tomato or peach for us. But we lack that connectivity and that storytelling, that narrative about seafood. So uh, I tried to put it on paper so that we can have this as a, as a reference. 
And while it's not a cookbook, uh, it certainly will tell you how to think about any species you come across that's caught in uh, our waters. Um, I'll give you some confidence, confidence to put it onto the plate. Uh, and then also uh, this very platform that we're on right now, Ruby, our course, seafoodliteracy.com. Uh, it's a very accessible 15-hour um, uh, course. You can drop in and out of it whenever you want to, take it at your own pace, but it's really meant to teach a, a total literacy, fluency, competence, and competency, or confidence in all things uh, scaled, salty, and shelled. So with that, I'm going to start uh, the unboxing, but also get uh, to some more questions. So, Nicholas. The most sustainably farmed seafood seem to be omnivorous or herbivorous uh, fish such as carp and tilapia find eaten primarily in other parts of the world. I would say true to a large extent. The U.S. has an appetite for more unsustainably farmed shrimp, uh, fish. How can we become more sustainable? Uh, well, Nicholas, you're absolutely right in that just because we can farm a species doesn't necessarily mean it's the right species to farm and mass. Um, that said, we are learning how to farm salmon very sustainably uh, to the point now where uh, it, it's industry leading. I mean, inspirational how much that industry has changed and evolved and grown. And I'm going to bring up my friend uh, Rick Moonen again here. Uh, he himself, he's got some great content online about the sort of the narrative arc of, of his learning journey about uh, farm salmon. Um you know, it, it was a product that, yeah, it, it was, it, they made some mistakes. It wasn't a great product. But you know what? The first net pen went into the water about 50 years ago. 50. I, I mean, cars were unsafe at any speed 50 years ago. A, a computer the size of the Pentagon 50 years ago couldn't do what my iPhone in my pocket can do now when I'm not even paying attention to it. Industries advance and evolve. Uh, and aquaculture is an industry that we are literally inventing in real time. It, the last time we got to invent a food system was 10,000 years ago when we first planted the seeds of modern civilization and agriculture. And now we've got aquaculture. Literally, we are the architects of it in real time. But to your point, uh, yeah, there are species that farm better, that are just better suited to being in captivity or to the economics of farming uh, or who naturally eat a diet that is less resource intensive. Uh, and we need to be looking at those species, but uh, it's not always just, hey, should we be eating more carp? It's also, hey, how can we innovate what those fish are eating? And salmon, for example, uh, farm salmon have long been dependent wholly upon um, anchoveta and other uh, small silver fish that have been mil caught in mass and then uh, milled down and reduced to feed. Um, but now a lot of those fish oils and fish meals are being replaced by uh, algaes that are being grown that deliver the same incredibly high omega-3 contents, uh, quality of, of the eating experience in the fish, uh, deliver on cost, but certainly deliver on the environmental uh, standards, but also deliver on animal welfare. You know, this is not just feeding a cow corn, which cows are not set up to do. Uh, the salmon, the, the fish that are fed this are, it, it is in harmony with their own physiology. So uh, we humans, we're, we're pretty innovative, interesting, creative people, thinkers, and uh, it's pretty exciting what's happening. But um, yeah, tilapia, carp, catfish, great industries that we have uh, in this country are really good options that just inherently lend themselves more towards sustainability principles. So in this box from my friends at Gulf of Maine Sashimi, I've got, uh, well, thanks, Jen. And that's, uh, that's awesome. I got a bag of scallops. They're probably out of the water just in a few hours. Um, you know, before I get my hands too dirty, I'm going to go back to another question. All right, Megan. Chef, I personally love the humble sardine in all forms. My husband refuses to touch them. Uh, do you have any way of preparing them for the squeamish? Uh, well, uh, if you're talking about fresh, um, sardines, yeah, there's a lot of ways to do it. I, I like to, uh, uh, fillet them and marinate them in a little bit of vinegar that tempers a little bit of that robust flavor that they're so lauded for by folks like yourself and not by folks like your husband. Um, 
that helps to temper that flavor. Smoke is also a really great balancing act. Uh, so sardines on the grill are fabulous. Uh, and also adding a little hint of sweetness really helps to punctuate the richness of the flesh. So I like to serve them with a, a salsa of chopped parsley, fine diced shallots and uh, raisins or currants uh, bloomed and a little bit of lemon juice and olive oil. And just that sweetness, the slight crunch of the shallot and the, the herbaceousness of the, the herb uh, really lifts the, the dish and it makes it a lot more palatable. Um, but if you'll, you'll look behind me, uh, I hope you can see that here. Uh, you can see my collection, and this is not me hoarding uh, fish here for the COVID epidemic. That's actually about the amount of canned seafood that we go through in a month because my little three-year-old uh, kid squid, I call him, uh, one of his very favorite foods is uh, cans of sardines, which he calls baby sharks. Doo -doo 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 -doo. Hey, I just did that to you. Put that in your head. Um, but sardines, they're, they're great. Open the can, a little bit of hot sauce, and just eat them straight as is. Um, flake them over a salad of thick sliced heirloom tomatoes in the in the heat of summer with the, the olive oil from the can drizzled over some fresh picked herbs, thin sliced red onion. Uh, mix them into a panzanella salad. Uh, yesterday's stale bread cut into cubes, uh, tossed with some roasted butternut squash and uh, turnips, maybe a couple of fresh ripe tomatoes you know, for a sort of summer fall dish, and then flake the fish right into it. Use the oil from the can, <coughs> excuse me, it, as part of the vinaigrette for the whole thing. So lots of ways to enjoy. And something I'm going to pull out is, well, this is the, uh, that's the original darling. How am I doing here? There you go. Look at the quality of that fish. So this is coming from my friends, again, at Gulf of Maine Sashimi. Uh, this is a hake, which is my very favorite of all of the cod family members. It's got this wonderfully quilted, delicate flake to it. Very different than that big convex curved flake of cod. Uh, but still with all the sweetness and that beautiful sort of baked potato aroma that cod family have. And, uh, well, that's a beauty. So, yeah, I'm just going to touch my computer now with fish fingers. So I know we're coming up towards the end of time here. So anybody that needs to jump off, hey, thank you so much for joining me. I'll take a, a few more questions and keep unboxing here. But um, expect to hear from us about some further resources. I hope you downloaded uh, – that PDF of the culinary categories. I hope you visit our friends at localcatch.org, uh, downeastdayboat.com, Gulf of Maine Sashimi, FultonFishMarket.com, Sea to Table, Dock to Dish, um, Oyster.guru forward slash shop, uh, and FishChoice.com. So thank you there. I'm going to see what else is in this box. What else do we have? All right, from Mariana. I just wanted to share, I live in Portugal, a fabulous seafood country with 365 recipes, traditionally for uh, cod and all things. All my life I've had the privilege to buy and eat the best fish directly from, almost directly from local fishermen. There's a lot of fish that never gets a big market. Local is the best way to taste it. I agree with you, absolutely. And one of the wonderful things about seafood is that, well, you know what, if I were to get on a plane and fly to the suburbs of LA, I'd find a Gap and a Banana Republic and I'd find restaurants that serve chicken. But if I go down to the wharf down in LA or San Diego, I'd find fish that just taste like nothing up here that I have available to me on the coast of Maine where the lobsters rule and cod is king. And well, you know, seafood is of place. And one of the greatest treats that I have in my life is getting to travel around the world and uh, taste different things. And uh, some of the very best seafood I've ever had has been in Portugal in, uh, in um, uh, the island of uh, Madeira. Uh, just some absolutely delightful limpets that I had there. But um, yeah, it's a, a great food culture. So thanks for sharing, Marianne. All right, Drew, uh, what seafood distribution companies do you see being good stewards of the sea? Um, well, there's some smaller, by smaller, I mean, half a billion dollar uh, companies like Samuels and Sons out of Philadelphia, 
Uh, you've got Foley Fish out of Boston, Red's Best out of Boston, Pro Fish, JJ McDonald uh, out of DC, Fortune Fish, uh, Seattle Fish Company, Chicago and, and Denver areas, Santa Monica Seafood, uh, really great companies that are, that are doing incredible work uh, and that have all joined together under the banner called CPACT, S-E-A-P-A-C-T. Uh, look them up. Uh, right now, the chair is a, a great friend of mine, Stacy Schultz from Fortune Fish. And this is a group of, of purveyors and vendors, wholesalers, processors that have gotten together to understand how in aggregate they can really not just participate in sustainability, but, but drive it. Um, and they're really leading lights uh, in the conversation. But, you know, also Cisco, Performance Food Group, U.S. Foods. Yeah, the, the big, big boys and girls in, in, you know, in, this, in this pool, they're doing incredible work too. They know that sustainability is, is here to stay. It's not a fad or a trend. And in fact, it's good for their business too. People get this now. And the, the strides that have been taken by even the largest players is truly inspirational. Um, so I would say that any reputable uh, supplier of any size and if they're going to look you in the eye and tell you about their fish, it's probably somebody you want to be supporting. So I've got a, uh, a whole monkfish tail here, two loins on either side. And what I'm going to do with this, I'll take the purplish skin off. I'll uh, simmer that into a beautiful, rich stock that is so gelatinous. You can almost take a ball of it when it's cold and throw it against a wall. It's, it's amazing. And then uh, I'll use a little bit of that. I'll flavor that with bay leaf, paprika, some roasted garlic. And then I'll braise this down like a, like a veal shank, almost like a, a monkfish asabuco with that center bone you know, sticking out. It makes an incredible presentation um, and a great way to use the whole fish. And well, it's certainly a conversation piece as well. All right. So another question from Colin, uh, second last question here. Uh, I find that some people tend to have a negative opinion about tilapia. Are there any pointers to give to prove the quality of tilapia? Uh, yeah, well, Colin, here's here's the truth about tilapia. There's some really, really just not very good tilapia out there. Uh, that's raised in ways that, that cut a lot of corners and, and don't care, and they're, they're just going for absolute lowest price. Um, you know, nameless, faceless commodity product. Uh, and then there's tilapia raised by farmers uh, who are revolutionizing what the fish can be and who, in my opinion, uh, have turned what is – sort of no, a little bit scoffed at as a culinary ingredient into what I think is really, truly a, can be a compelling ingredient. Um, groups like uh, Regal Springs Tilapia who operate out of uh, Thailand and uh, Mexico. I've been down to see some of their farms. They do an incredible job, not only with the fish itself as a quality ingredient, but sustainability wise, but also the work that they do in their communities uh, to uplift and create economies there. Um, and on the plate, it delivers, man. You take a little bit of fresh ginger, grated on a microplane, a little bit of panko breadcrumbs, tablespoon or two of butter, and maybe some uh, chopped uh, raisins, just rough chopped. Mix all that together into a, a breading and just lightly pat it onto the surface of the tilapia. Throw it in the toaster oven under the broiler, and whew, man. So bottom line is tilapia is a fish that has rightfully earned a bad reputation, uh, but it is also a fish that in the hands of some producers is rightfully uh, earning its keep uh, and its position as really a, a great quality product we should be looking for. Thanks, Colin. Appreciate it. Do a lot of commercially caught fish get sent to China and other countries to processing and then come back here for sale? Uh, from A.N.T. Yes, uh, that's absolutely true. And just the cost of labor, efficiencies. Uh, a lot of seafood does get exported that's caught here in America. It gets exported to places, particularly China, um, in a frozen state where it's thawed, uh, filleted or further processed into whatever market form it needs to be, uh, and then often refrozen and, and sent back to us here. And, well, you know, however much you sort of may lament that system, the bottom line is it is a result of globalized economies. Uh, I don't quite have a, a catch-all answer for is this good or bad. It has both um, aspects to it. 
you know, and it, it's just part of the way our economy works and how seafood uh, can land on our plates uh, and at the grocery stores at prices that we find um, attractive. So yes, it, it's a reality. It's certainly not the only reality. Um, there's a movement to bring a lot of that processing back onto our shores. Uh, folks like my great friend Peter Handy at Bristol Seafoods here in Maine uh, and many others, Trident Seafoods, Fortune Fish in the in the center of the country, uh, are making great strides to open processing facilities to deliver high quality products. So uh, it's just kind of deciding where your virtues and values lie and then uh, finding the producer processor that, uh, you know, can meet that. Um, but yeah. All right. So thanks, Ed. So last question here from Rob. Shellfish, how sustainable are crab family? I see so much snow and big crabs uh, from the north and many fishermen giving up their lives to get the crab catches. Uh, very true. And it's called the deadliest catch for uh, a reason. You know, guys like uh, Captain Keith uh, Coburn, uh, a, a friend. Yeah, it's a lifestyle. I mean, fishing across the board is, is the top, if not the second uh, most dangerous profession there is. Um, you know, we've got to laud those who go down to the sea in ships to ply the, the wide waters and the wonders of the deep. Uh, they do that at, at their risk uh, for our benefit. Um, yeah, the, the crab fisheries up in the northern seas are, uh, from what I understand, currently doing quite well. Uh, a lot of them are under uh, sustainability management. Uh, whether it's you know, best in class science and scientific based management uh, that we employ here in the United States as just, well, it's how we do things uh, to a product that's coming in as certified, uh, coming from a certified fishery from the Marine Stewardship Council uh, is another way to look. Um, but yeah, those products are great. They come to us via a uh, you know, supply chain. They're frozen on the boat. There's very little, uh, waste in the system once they get into the into the supply chain. Uh, they're certainly a luxury ingredient to, to many, but they're also available at the uh, the Golden Corral on the buffet sometimes. So in fact, I think a brawl just broke out over the buffet in Florida or something. Anyway, the news we read on Facebook when we're bored at home quarantined. But um, crab is also, it, it's one of the most valuable fisheries in America. Um, and not just snow and king crab, but also uh, blue crab. Uh, from around the country, Dungeness crab, of course, the, the legendary ingredient of the uh, Pacific Northwest, box crab, spider crab. Um, the problem with crab, though, aside from the really big ones, is that they come in, the meat comes inside of a shell, and Americans don't tend to want to work too hard for it. But um, as a son of the Chesapeake, there's nothing I like better than cutting up my fingers on a little carapace of crabs as I sit there for four hours, just eating slowly, drinking beers, and and just enjoying the bounty that we're so fortunate to have. So thanks, Rob. I appreciate the question. And uh, it's the end of the question. So thank you all so much who are still with us here. Uh, look for us to share a few more resources with you uh, in the coming days. Uh, check out my resources, American Seafood, the book, uh, seafoodliteracy.com. Um, but uh, yeah, I appreciate all of you. And in these tough times, uh, I hope that you can find opportunity to tell someone around you that you appreciate them. Uh, we're all in this together. We're on one big boat uh, here uh, in our communities and our society. So treat each other with love and respect. I love you so much. I appreciate you. And uh, thanks for joining me. Eat seafood, support local small scale artisan fisheries, buy seafood wherever it comes from responsible sources and, uh, Join me again every Thursday at this time, 2 o'clock Eastern, 11 a.m. Uh, West Coast time for webinars on the topic of all things salty, scaled, and shelled. Thanks so much, y'all. Take care. Be safe. And keep washing your hands. Got it? Cool. I appreciate you. See ya.